Howdy everyone, I am so delighted to be here. Often you think about an expert as somebody from out of town, but it may be if you're on main campus, the west campus seems like it's so far west it might as well be El Paso. Um, the other thing that I would say is I didn't know, and I might, I might be on another planet, I was probably one of the few people in town that didn't know that Reed Building was any different from Reed Arena. So the first time I came to a meeting here, I ended up at the arena instead of here. I know this is a drug and society class, and you're probably thinking, aging? Why would we be talking about aging in a drug and society class? I won't have time to go into this today, but drug substance abuse is a major problem all throughout the life course. And people do study substance abuse and aging, whether it's people who age in with drugs or late life onset of drug abuse. So what I'd like to do though today is talk specifically about aging. And this is what I hope that you will learn in the time we're together to understand the theories and the reality of aging, to know specifically what healthy aging means, to be able to list, to know the predictors of healthy aging, and then what I'm gonna spend most of my time on is giving some examples of behavioral, social, environmental strategies that can actually help enhance healthy aging. So, um, as a researcher, I would call myself a translational researcher. So I go from research to practice. And what I've spent the last 30 years or so are looking at these topics in relationship to aging. It's one, to be able to know what are the behavioral and social risk factors for health and illness, and then to understand how these factors relate to self-management and coping with a chronic disease or disability. And then I am very interventionist oriented. So it's a matter of designing, evaluating um, interventions, and not only to design those interventions, but to understand how they are implemented, how they can be disseminated, and then how they can be sustained for maximum reach. So this is a question about how long we will live. It doesn't look like hardly anybody in here um, is in their 60s, but if you're born today, you're gonna live on average life expectancy almost 80 years. And even if you're 65, you can expect to live about 20 years longer. And everybody knows about the baby boomers. Every day since January, every day 10,000 more people in this country are turning 65. If you think about the oldest old, that's people who are 85 and older, they're gonna live almost a woman seven years longer. And a person who's 100, a centenarian, is even expected to live more than two years. How many of you know somebody who's lived to 100? This is great. You will know more and more people. Right now, um, in the last year that they had the statistics in 2009 or 10, there were almost 65,000 people in our country who were centenarians, and that number is expected to grow too. So what I'd like to do is just to talk about some social and behavioral principles of aging. If you think about aging, not all older people are alike. There's incredible heterogeneity in the older population. So somebody who's 60 may be um, the same health consequences or same health setting as somebody who's an 80, or somebody who's 80 may actually be healthier than somebody who's 50. So a lot of heterogeneity. Aging just doesn't happen at 65. What we used to say at the National Institute on Aging is aging is from birth to death. The minute you're born, you start aging. It's a process. Aging doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's part of the social context in which you live. So aging in Texas is different than aging in other parts of the US, and aging in the US is different than aging globally. Aging, and this is what people have learned over time, it's not invariant, but it's malleable. And that means that there's potential for intervention. People will not age the same. There can be interventions that will improve that aspect of aging. So what I wanna do is talk a moment about ageist stereotypes. 
and they are still part of the cultural landscape. Um, I want to give you some evidence about how the aging stereotypes are actually hazardous to your health and that it's really important not to just end up with some, an idea about what somebody can do at a certain age, but when you're designing programs, don't just look at age, but look at people's functional abilities. If we're talking about something like a physical activity program, there shouldn't be just a thing that says, nobody welcome over 65, but it should be, what are your abilities to get into a certain program? And that we re need to continually confront ageism. So ageism was coined in the late 60s by Robert Butler. He was a Renaissance man who was actually the first director of the National Institute on Aging. And he talked about um, ageism as another form of bigotry. It's one of those isms like racism or sexism. It's stereotyping or discrimination against people because they are old or it's prejudice or discrimination either for or against a group because of their age. This is what people I think traditionally thought about old age. Look at all the people who were sick, frail, needing help, lonely, unhappy. How many people have given their parents or your grandparents these um, birthday cards and on the birthday card they have these ageist jokes that are supposed to be funny you know when all you want for your birthday is not to be reminded of your age or the last one it takes twice as long to look half as good this is in our culture the sort of meaning of age in a derogatory sense often They've done studies where they've actually asked people about their experience with ageism. And here are some of the quotes. Someone assumed I couldn't understand because of my age. Someone told me, you're too old for that. Actually, my sister told my mom in her late 80s, you're too old to learn how to use a computer. And my mom said, I'm not. And finally, at 90, she got a computer. And her only response was, if, my sister, if your sister hadn't told me how old I was, I would have been on the computer two more years. Um, some people say, I was treated with less dignity and respect because of my age. Or, and this often happens in healthcare, a doctor or a nurse assumed my elements were caused by age. So you have two knees, one of them's bad, and they say it's because you're old. They don't talk about the other knee um, and the kind of things you've done and how it can be approved, but they assume that you have those aches and pains because you're older. There is a lot of age bias in healthcare. When you look at healthcare, Older adults often get less aggressive treatments. The assumption is they're too frail for the most aggressive treatments. And this happens a lot in areas whether it's heart disease or cancer. Older adults are often seen as not good candidates for health promotion programs. So traditionally you'd have a physical activity program and they would have age cutoffs. Um, or in studies, you don't know the benefit of some of these programs because traditionally they had age cutoffs in a program, a drug, star, a drug uh, trial or different kinds of studies. So you never knew what the actual benefit was. Age stereotypes have been shown to be hazardous to your health. There was actually a study that, thought, that asked people what they thought about aging and they got whether they were positive or negative views. And those people with negative self-perceptions, when they looked at their mortality rates over time, they actually didn't live as long because they were holding those negative stereotypes. And this is controlling for all the other things that you would think would be related to mortality. So it's really important to challenge these aging stereotypes. The pictures we saw about older people being sick and frail, this concept that older people are set in their ways. If somebody's been smoking when they're young, it's too late to get them to change when they're 80. Or if they've never been active, you can't get them to be active. This concept that it's too late to see gains, why get an older person in a program, they're not going to benefit, and that physical uh, activity is harmful to older people. All of these are stereotypes which need to be challenged. So let's think of some stereotypes. Dirty old man. Everybody know who this is? 
Hugh Hefner and his bunnies. So you think about dirty old men. Why can't you think of an older couple gardening, being physically active? <laughs> old women, old maid, a game that I was familiar with. If you were a, a woman and you weren't married, you were the spinster and nobody wanted to get the old maid in the card game. But think of how graceful and charming somebody like Katherine Hepburn has been. Bathing beauties. Sports Illustrated, this is probably the issue that sells more than any others. But what about older women being physically active swimming? I love this, biker chicks. And obviously the next biker chick is an old lady on an exercise bike. <laughs> so these are the stereotypes that I think that we hold. It's what we may think, but it also shows us what the possibilities are. Muscle men. This guy I love. This is a book that is called Growing Old is Not for Sissies. It has great pictures of older athletes doing incredible things. So I think the message that I want you to get is to rethink aging and to think of aging and activity simultaneously. This guy, the one who's the pole vaulter, there are senior games. I think Ronnie Gibson told me this guy is in his 80s. Look at him. He's obviously doing something that we associate with much younger people. So let me talk a few moments about healthy aging principles. Um, the first thing that I hope you've gotten is this concept that healthy aging is possible. We're talking about how long people live and how there will be more people who live to 100. It's not how long you live, but it's the quality of that life that I think we need to gear into. So the goal of healthy aging is really to optimization, to have optimal physical, mental, social well-being and functioning. So healthy aging are all of those domain, domains that equa equate to quality of life. But how do you get that? It's something that requires what you do yourself from the person. It, it's related to the families and the communities that we live in and the kinds of interventions that we might be engaged in. So keys to healthy aging. I could have shown you reams and reams of statistics. This is from epidemiological, social, behavioral, clinical research. Years and years, decades of research. It started, I got to NIH when I was in 1980, but for the 30 years before, people always want to know that fountain of youth question, what is the key to healthy or successful aging? We just talked about stereotypes, so positive attitude about aging, that's really important. We now talk about uh, the brain health, keeping your mind active, and everybody who's over 50 wants to do crossword puzzles or Sunuko. It's being physically, Sunuko, it's being physically active, it's eating healthy, it's staying socially engaged, it's managing your stress, and it's living in healthy communities. So all of these factors are really the keys to healthy aging. It's not just a pill that you can take, but it's what you do, it's wh who you live with, and it's the communities that surround you. I love this cartoon. Active aging is so important to good health. And I do research on doctor-patient interactions. And you know, we say that physicians have incredible influence with their patients. And I love this quote if you can't see it in the back. What fits your busy better schedule, your, your busy schedule better? Exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day. And the physicians that we work with tell us that they could write books on excuses. They've seen every excuse about why people aren't physically active. It's too hot, it's too cold, I'm too busy, I'm too tired. And so these are the sort of excuses people have and this is why it's important to understand what motivates behavior. So what I'm gonna talk about is really creating healthy communities for active aging. Where and how we choose to live is really what's going to affect our health and well-being. So if we take that list of keys to healthy aging and we say it a different way, it's staying active. 
And there are many ways to stay active. The Surgeon General talks about, on average, 30 minutes a day, moderate intensive activity. They don't tell you what you have to do, but they tell you to be active. And so whether it's whether you walk, you will, you know, which is biking, whatever you do to stay physically active, lots of literature shows how important this is for both physical and mental well-being. Staying connected is also so incredibly important. It's important at any stage in life. It's having family, friends, community, um, the neighborhoods that you live in. This is so important. But what it is, it's just not what you do that makes you healthy. It's when you stay engaged, it's a reciprocal effect you will also benefit your community. So my perspective is really a public health perspective. It's people in their environment, people affecting their environment and the environment affecting people. If you want personally to know how long you might live, there is a great web page. It's www.living2100.com. And what you do is you answer a variety of questions about your personal habits, your family, your community, and then it pops up how long you're going to live. And for me, it said something like 98. Um, but it's the situation, so you'll sort of know. And then it pops up however long it says on average you'll live from the epidemiological literature. And it'll give you a hint, and it'll say, so, you know, you're not physically active. If you were a little bit more active, you'd live this much longer. So it's a really nice way to look at it with your friends just to see the kind of things you're doing and what the consequences are. So what I'd like to talk about is this concept of smart growth. And there's a whole movement of smart growth. And it's really called activity-friendly communities. And what I'm going to be reading you and letting you look at are the 10 principles of smart growth. And that is a community that has smart growth is one that uh, creates a range of housing opportunities and choices. So everybody doesn't have to live in the same kind of place, but you get to choose where you live. And this is really important in aging because older people want to stay in their homes. They don't want to go um, live in a nursing home. They don't even really want to go live with families. They want to have that choice to be able to live in their home and have their home be safer for them. We want to create more walkable neighborhoods. We want to encourage community and stakeholder collaboration because this is what is important, the community perspective. And this sort of fostering communities with a strong sense of place. How many people, when you sort of go places, when they ask you where you're from, do you say I'm from College Station? Do you say that with pride? How many say that? Well, that would be a sense of community. Dr. Kreider, when you say where you're from, do you have a sense of community? Whoop, OK, we all do. Um, then there's some things that the architects or the urban planners would say, and that is having development uh, decisions that are predictable and cost effective. So it's what you do when you're building new neighborhoods. It's promoting mixed land uses. And they're actually starting, and I'll show you some pictures, they're starting to do this in Bryan, where it's not like you live in one spot and you have to jump in your car to do everything, but it's that kind of neighborhood where you walk out of your front door and you can go have coffee. You can buy the newspaper. You can mail your letter. So that's uh, mixed use. Open space. Texas and this area in the Brazos Valley is really lucky because we have wonderful open space, farmland, natural beauty, but it's really important to maintain that, not to have all those fields paved over. To be able to provide a variety of transportation choices, and now there is in the Texas legislature a bill that's called Complete Streets. And it's really sharing the roads where you can have pedestrian traffic, you can have bicyclists, you can have cars, you can have buses, you can have trains. Everybody needs to share the road. It's also strengthening um, 
and directing development toward existing communities. So it's what you would call refill. There are a lot of older towns, and even downtown Bryan is an example. Instead of giving up on a town and building someplace else, it's going back and reinvigorating an area that's an existing community. And then it's taking advantage of compact building design. And this is really something, if you think about Houston, where there is sprawl everywhere. So this is the web page. If you want to know more about smart growth, these are some of the principles. Why they were important is that the EPA, in collaboration with aging organizations, the AARP, the um, public health organizations, the Centers for Disease Control, have this recognition award, and it's to award communities that merge two concepts. The smart growth principles that I've just talked about, so how to make our environment more activity friendlier and healthier and safer, and also active aging principles. What can we do to have activity programmed into our daily lives and to have more opportunities to be physically active? So the EPA has this award. Here is the good news. The Brazos Valley has actually won two of these awards. Only about 20 communities around the country have won. In 2007, we had a commitment award. That meant, and this is through the Brazos Valley Council of Governments in conjunction with the Brazos Valley Area Agency on Aging, got together and made a commitment that they wanted this place to be a more active place for seniors and actually of people of all ages. In 2010, we actually listened to people in the community, we did a lot more, and we won an achievement award. This year, only two, two uh, cities around the area won, us and Charlotte, North Carolina. This is an amazing accomplishment. What I'd like to do is sort of tell you why it is that this national panel picked this area. The Brazos Valley had several achievements downtown revitalization. How many of you go to downtown Bryan? It is a lot more fun now than it used to be, and you'll see pictures why. Age-friendly recreation areas. How many people go to Wolf Pen Creek? That's another one. Um, alternative transportations in rural areas. Rural uh, areas often don't have the transportation they need to get people to medical and other appointments. We've done something about it. Evidence-based um, active aging programs, I'll tell you about that, and then community resource guides. So downtown Bryan has been amazing. They now have, as the people who raised your hands, they have pedestrian-friendly improvements. The sidewalks, the lighting, the crosswalks, the shade. It's a pleasant place to go. It incorporates these principles of smart growth. Um, what they did is they had a lot of citizen input into the process. They didn't just have planners say, we know what's best for you, but they had town hall meetings and meetings of the business people about what you would want to see. And so now what they really do is they have higher density mixed use development that it encourages people to be more physically active and also less dependent on cars. Who do we know? Dr. McKayer that lives downtown. Dr. Right, she lives in one of those lofts. She can walk outside of her door and get coffee. It's amazing. This is a sort of picture of the left, what it used to look like before your time, unless you've been a resident here, and what it looks like now. So you can see better pedestrian crossings, wider sidewalks, and the streetscapes. Not to mention First Fridays, which is one of my personal favorites. So if you walk through Bryan, this is a nicer destination than it ever was before. Upbeat is a project that was funded through the State Health Department, and it's something like um, umbrella partnerships, be active in our town. 
And we had a city beat contest. So if any of you were there at First Friday, we actually uh, wanted to do walking trails downtown. They already have an audio tape about people who go downtown and sort of walk around. And we know from the science that if you walk around, you will, I mean, if you see interesting things, you're more likely to walk around. So we wanted to have signage. We had a city vote. It's amazing. We now have the signs that will be up before June that the students in architecture I think were actually the winners. So that's what we've done downtown. Uh, many of us, and I saw Robin in the room, are part of this youth leadership group where we are actually working with uh, students in sixth to ninth grade to have them be aware of their environment. They did audits around the Lincoln School and the Neal School. They looked at the environment. Were there safe, safe streets? Was there trash? Were there mean dogs? Um, was there traffic running, you know, uh, tra traffic going up too fast up and down the streets? And they're going to take that information and present to city councils and city officials. It's youth coming to say what could make our neighborhood safer. Um, the upbeat walking circuit, this is the actual walking circuit that you'll see the signs, um, a half mile, a mile, or a mile and a half. Wolf Pen Creek has extensive walking and biking trails. Um, they also have wheelchair accessible trails. They incorporate some of these principles of smart growth and um, they're close by to shopping and public transportation. I just read in the paper this morning that there's going to be a bike um, program in town, a user bike, so that people on campus can get out of one building and there'll be a bike uh, docking station. You can jump on a bike and go someplace else. That is incredible that campus is actually having a bike sharing program. They have that in many other cities, and I'm glad it's coming here too. Wolf Pen Creek. This is a guy that Ronnie Gibson saw on the street, and he goes, wow, this is really nice. This guy is probably just starting to walk. He listens to his story. This guy walks most days. He's already lost more than 100 pounds. And if he keeps walking, the next time we see him, we may not even see this guy, because he may be so small. So senior games. Um, this is an opportunity for people who are 50 and older to be competitive in sports, the sports of their choosing. The Brazos Valley actually hosts some of these games. And so you have people come in and do these games. And what we'd like to do is not just make this an event that's once a year or once every year, but how do you get people to stay active between the games? Um, and that's what they're working on. <coughs> Transportation we talked about, there's now um, vans and senior escorts, so if you know any older person in the community that's having difficulty getting to a doctor's appointment or an appointment that's going to make a difference for their health, then there's a place to call and somebody will come pick them up. Chronic disease self-management, there's been a lot of literature about what people can do to manage their own uh, conditions. We now have these evidence-based programs that we are disseminating widely through the community. What they basically do is they empower older adults to manage their health. They give them a sense that just because I have a heart condition or diabetes, I can't do anything, but it tells them what they can do and how they can interact with their families and also in the communities. They do a lot of these behavior change principles of setting a goal, and we all always know it's important to set a manageable goal. So it's start low, go slow. To know what the uh, barriers are to be able to problem solve and to be able to have a plan. This makes a huge difference. And in the Brazos Valley, we have these programs. In Texas, we have promised to reach about 4,000 people, and nationally, they're going to reach over 50,000 people. So active options. Um, some people say, well, I would be active if I just knew where to go. That's one of the excuses the doctors say they hear all the time. So um, Active Options was actually an online 
um, program where people, whether it was fitness centers, would sort of be able to say, this is a place you can go, or we are now expanding it and we're talking about the Brazos Valley Obesity Prevention Network is going to take this on and it's going to reinvent it so that you will know where parks are, you'll know how to do Google Earth to know where parks are, you'll know what kinds of uh, programs are particularly uh, senior or, or activity friendly for older people. And so there won't be this excuse, I just can't go because I don't know where to go. Um, we talk a lot about environments. This is pictures like of smart growth. This is the opposite of smart growth. These are the environments that really support sedentary or inactive behavior. What we want to do is to have environments that support active living. I would love it if the Brazos Valley looked like this in terms of seeing people <coughs> out biking and walking and people of all ages. <coughs> Same thing about diet. You know, we see this too much in our society. But this is what we could see. And I look right outside of my building. I'm in the School of Public Health. And I think that's where the Howdy Garden is. And it is incredible. There are people out there doing gardens that will go to both the food bank and also to people who sign up. And they're always looking for people to join that project. So what is the end? It's sort of what I hope that you've learned is the choices we make is really going to determine our future, our health. So it's this promotion of healthy lifestyles and um, whether it's physical activity or healthy eating, the, what, the kind of risk factors we've talked about. It's learning and being able to embody self-management skills for those people who do have chronic illnesses. It's finding ways at every point in your life to stay socially engaged. And then from the environmental factor, it's really thinking of universal design. And there's this movement that's called 880. And what it means is, if you design a neighborhood or environment that is safe for a child who's eight, bets are it's going to be safe and fun for a person, an adult who's 80. So I thank you very much.